Good morning, everyone. So <clears throat> about six weeks ago, Matt, Matt McCleary here called me up and he said, hey, Marius, you know, we're going to have a blockbuster panel on product tankers. And we'd like you to moderate it. And of course, I was very flattered when he told me he was going to be on the panel. Uh, so I said, yes, of course. And then, of course, as I hang up, I got immediately nervous because I remember I hadn't seen Robert Burgerby for two years due to COVID. And the first thing he said to me when we met a few months ago, he came right over to me and he said, you still don't understand the difference between crude trading and product trading? <laughs> so uh, Robert, together with everyone in the, pa in, the, in the room here, we look forward to learn from all of you about the current product market. I will do uh, a quick introduction here of this tremendous panel. We have from TORM, Jakob Melgor. TORM is uh, NASDAQ and Copenhagen Stock Exchange listed with a market cap of $1.2 billion, roughly. The company owns MRs, LRs, LR2s, a total of 81 ships, and uh, it's a tremendous fleet. We have Hafnia, the CEO of Hafnia, Michael Sko. Michael Sko's uh, company, Hafnia, is listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange with a market cap of roughly $1.7 billion, and they operate a staggering 246 ships out of those 82 at home. I have no idea how he sleeps at night. We have Ardmore CEO, Tony Gurney. Uh, Ardmore Shipping listed in the US with a market cap of approximately close to $300 million. We have Scorpio Tankers, President Robert Bugby, 113 ships on bare boat and leased. And next to me here, we have the Oddfjell CEO Norwegian listed company with a market cap of $450 million. The company is in the sophisticated chemical tanker business. So a little on the side of the other companies here, and we look forward to learn about the difference and the similarities. And they have 84 ships that they own, lease, and have in their pool. So yes, Matthew Wright is a blockbuster panel. We have uh, lately, seen a product tank market reach new highs. Some will say all-time highs. Tremendous rate, $40,000, $50,000, $60,000 reported. And uh, I wanted to start talking about the market a little bit. Um, and if I start with you, Jakob, uh, what do you see as the main drivers now for, for this staggering sudden rise in the market? Yeah, well, I think we need to take a step back. Uh, I think Andreas put it very fine that you know geopolitics is really playing into uh, our markets currently and, and anything to do with energy. But if we take a step back and look at the world, that uh, how we looked at it, I think most of us here on the panel on the 23rd of February, where nobody, at least I, did not believe that we would have a war the following day. Um, at that time, what the product tanker market was doing was actually it's, it was already recovering. So we had inventories that were historically at five year averages or below. We had a COVID pandemic more or less behind us in at least parts of the world, leading to an increase in demand that was sort of playing out. And uh, on top of, uh, of that, the, the world was really for the product tanker business seeing that we had closed no less than 20 refiners in the developed economies during the pandemic due to the crisis. Uh, and that led to that you were already seeing longer ton mile for most of the products that we were doing. Examples being, I think it's well known that Australia, New Zealand, and also South Africa closed more or less all of their refinery sectors. And we were already starting to see at that time that it was building. So in our projection, we expected that 2022 would be a step up in demand of, let's say, 3 4%. And on the supply side, as was also illustrated yesterday, really, we're looking at over the next three years, all in net fleet growth of maybe 3 4% during that period. So that is, that is the stage that we had. And we were coming back to profitability, many of us on the panel here. And then came uh, uh, this war, which really just 
came at a time when everything was lined up for recovery in the market and that the closure, not sanction-wise, but self-sanctioning of a lot of the Russian uh, products, especially, obviously, diesel, simply turned the world upside down and that we are now experiencing, especially on the diesel side, that there is a lack of diesel globally and it's being transported longer distances, leading to these extreme freight rates that we've seen. I think, I don't know about my, my colleagues here on the panel, but week by week, it's been like going from 20 to 30 to 40, then a little slowdown back to 35. And currently, if I look at the market, there is no market for any of our vessel classes that is below $50,000. This is a unique situation and it's across all segments. And when, uh, as we see in all shipping segments from time to time, all stars align occasionally, like we saw now, like you explained. Um, Robert, is it sustainable? I think so. He's oh, given an oh, sorry. Hello? I think he's given a, a really fantastic introduction as to why we got here. And I think that the why we got here is why it's going to be sustained. And you know, here I'm talking about a strong market. You know, whether the actual you'll obviously have fluctuation in daily rates. Right now, you know, you've got 50-50. There's no reason to think that the rates don't continue higher than here because the cost of freight is still very low compared to the value of the product. But it will stay strong, relatively strong, for all the reasons that have just been given. And I think it's very important to understand that. You know, do talk about jokingly the difference between oil and product, but it's important to understand this just to explain why the product market will be sustained. Is oil itself is not useful. We can't do anything really with oil. It has to be refined. And what we're first talking about is a refinery scarcity in the places where we need refineries. That's what's causing the demand for the product fleet. And the product fleet itself is inelastic. Like all shipping fleets, it's short-term, very inelastic. And that's what's causing the movement up and the crunch up in rates. Why you're going to have these extreme rates is the customer, the charterer, is not really caring about the ship owner and what they pay. They're so freaked out by having record low inventories against uncertain supply that they're too afraid to negotiate with the ship owner. They have to go in and take the cargo. Their usual tricks of saying on a Wednesday, look, the market's heated up too much this week. We're no longer going to fix ships, and we're going to draw from the market and come back in a few days' time no longer works because the owners can sit there and say, fine, but the ship's going to be fixed by someone else tomorrow. So that's what's, what's really going on. The next thing is that you don't actually have to believe me. You don't have to believe anyone on this panel. The most important component in the market is telling you it's going to be sustained. The charter rates in the product market have ripped up in the last three, four months. We've moved from six-month charters in the low mid-teens to three-year charters on MRs at around $23,000 a day You've got $30,000 a day now in the LR2s. And most importantly, I'm pretty sure by the end of next week, you're going to see five-year charters. The customer is saying it's sustained. Now, no trader, no customer takes a ship at a rate that they don't think they're going to exceed in the market. So you've got very strong headline and very strong base levels in the market. So, Michael, you've done a lot of work over the last few years now to optimize your company, and now sort of all the stars are aligned. Was this uh, sort of how you, how you, uh, what you rigged it for when you, was this as predicted? <laughs> I think that would probably be an exaggeration, right? But, um, but I think, I mean, as both uh, Robert and, and Jacob said, when you looked at, at how the stars were aligned in terms of uh, low inventories, um, the low supply of ships, etc. And you can never know exactly when the markets will rise again. But what you can know is that when markets put itself in a very vulnerable situation like this, it would have been a matter of maybe six, nine months before we would have seen any geopolitical event that would have spiked this market. It then happened, you know, sooner than maybe we would have expected. But I think fundamentally, 
if you analyze what all people here in the panel said the last six to nine months, we kept on saying that the way the world is going, you're setting the energy complex up for a very, very difficult time if there's any disruption to anything. And when you see into that situation, what you should try to do in our business, knowing it's volatile as it is, is to try to position yourself in the sense that one thing is to buy assets, but that's kind of, you know, that's also a long-term decision, but more about do you keep your fleet spot? Do you let your hedges run off because you think that within the next 12 months, things potentially now can have a high upside? All these things is what we all had to relate to, and I think this was really, you know, it's not a prediction about when markets were going to happen, but I think we had seen that we were set up for a very strong market improvement over a number of years. And Tony, clearly the Uc uh, Ukraine-Russia war is a factor in all of this, unfortunately. But uh, if you take that out of it, uh, will we still see as strong pressure in the market as we have? Uh, first, I want to just mention that this is a much easier discussion than it was a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Ma so Matt McClare's uh, annual softball okay. conversation. A, a lot of great things have been said already. I, I just to fill in a few uh, a few points. Um, I fully yep. agree with what the panel said so far, and the kind of the, the setup that Jakob uh, presented us with at the beginning. I think that um, if you think back to the beginning of the year, <coughs> I think the consensus was we were going to have a good year. At that time, what was still missing was jet fuel, and that's still coming back strongly. And I think anybody that's been traveling through airports and yeah, hold it up a bit higher. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so I think jet fuel is still coming back strongly. Um, you know, I think part of the inflation story is an, an economy that is having difficulty but is nevertheless recovering from the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, pent-up demand that's coming to the fore now. Um, one other observation to make is that, um, you know, in other sectors, congestion has been a big part of the story. That's not a part of this story. Um, it's really distance and volumes. And I think enough of us here have probably observed in their own fleets we're putting ships on extraordinarily long voyages, you know, basically half with, halfway around the world. And that's notable for two reasons. Obviously, it increases ton mile demand, but those ships are out of the market for 90 days. Okay, so, you know, there's some visibility into what's happening. And, you know, as uh, I think um, uh, Robert was, you know, mentioning in terms of rate levels, they are extraordinary. I mean, like we're all fixing occasionally ships over 100,000 a day. Okay, the averages might, you know, still be in the 40s or high 30s, but uh, it's a very, very spiky, buoyant market now. Thank you. And Harald, you're in the chemical tanker business. So um, maybe a little on the side, you have stainless steel ships, you have super segregators, partial tankers. Um, but is there a direct crossover to chemicals? And are you experiencing the same pressure in rates and when you renegotiate your COAs or requirement contracts? Well, uh, the short answer is uh, yes, there is a direct crossover. Uh, the correlation between CPP and chemicals over the past 20 years is approximately 0.84, so, uh, so the connection is, is clearly there. The big difference is, uh, is the volatility. Uh, you see significantly less volatility in the chemical tanker market than what you see within CPP. And I think the reason for that reduced volatility is the fact that 50% of our capacity is, is, uh, is secured to, through uh, contracts. When it comes to the outlook, I think you look, have to look at the supply demand uh, picture and, and particularly on the supply side, we see, uh, I would say, a very favorable fleet outlook going forward. On paper, the, 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 the there is zero fleet growth, but when you counter in uh, the speed reductions that will become mandatory next year. When you counter in uh, uh, smaller vessels that go into domestic trades, swing tonnage going back to CPP, then I think we will see a negative fleet growth in the, in the coming years. Thank you. And uh, Jakob, did you have a comment there? Yeah, you asked uh, regarding Russia, and I think it's an important observation or dilemma that we all have is that currently we're sort of in the very early inning of what could become a very long war. And ultimately, this will have consequences for all of us, but also I at a micro level for the product tanker business. So, and, th and we have, of course, like many others, tried to play it out. Okay, let's just be hopeful. Let's call this war over. There's a ceasefire. What will happen? Will our mar markets simply just crash back to where we've experienced for now five lousy years, or will we still be able to have a utilization rate that is higher. 
Um, my own personal observation would be that I do not believe that Europe will hand itself back into the control of Putin on energy, even if there is miraculously uh, a ceasefire or peace in Ukraine, which I'm personally very much hoping for. However, this means that the leg, I'm asked by a lot of investors, and I can assure you, I'm sure my colleagues have the same feeling, that certainly investors are very keen to have meetings. And the first question in most of these meetings is, does this market have legs? And I think the important thing is that all the fundamentals that Robert also pointed to are in place. And I think the biggest risk would obviously be that the refinery ecosystem will sort of turn back to what it was pre-war. And I think that the political risk of that happening uh, is extremely low. So the market has legs. And we will, as Andreas put it, we will have some fun for a number of years. Thank you. Great. Um, shifting over now to, to sh your share prices. When you factor in what has happened year to date in the overall market, that has just been awful. You know, at Arctic, we cover a lot of sectors, not just shipping. And, you know, we have customers that have taken beatings in a lot of different sectors. Look at what, how your share prices have performed is just tremendous. Torm, you're up about 70% year to date. Half now, you're up 80%. Ardmore, 125%. Scorpio, staggering 190%. And and uh, odd fuel as well, 60%. When you have such momentum in your stock, um, of course, I'm sure you always consider it massively undervalued. But you also occasionally need to do something. And um, Michael, in Hafnia, you a few months ago, you took advantage of, of what started to be the big rise here now, and you raised uh, about $100 million. Um, what was the rationale, the tactical rationale for that race? Yeah, so, so this was basically due to the fact that, um, which Andrea has mentioned as well actually, so thank you for that, that we had, uh, we've been quite busy acquiring tonnets, 44 ships, and uh, all of those were basically financed 100%. So as we entered uh, this year, we wanted to be prudent in terms of bringing back the balance sheet to where we'd like to see it. So the 100 million doesn't cover the overall equity portion that we would normally prefer to see in these transactions, but it was a start. Um, and another effect that was important for us was really to try to create a bit more free float in our shares. So, you know, we're one of these companies that as you grow, you've been lacking behind on trading liquidity. So those two in combination has helped. And I think if, if I look back at it now, <clears throat> I mean, we basically uh, increased the free float about two to 300% of the shares. And uh, through that transaction that we did, uh, those two we did earlier this year, we added about 25% to the earning days for, for 2022. So see it more as, as, a, as a prudent step to actually try to make sure, despite that there's a lot of money being earned, we want to make sure that if you want to be 100% spot, as we would like to be now, because we think market has legs, it's also prudent to make sure that your balance sheet isn't over levered. So that was kind of the rationale behind it. And uh, when you look at sort of the, the easy matrix in shipping, you look at the net asset value for a company. And, and uh, you know, even if things go twofold, threefold, you know, you can still lag your own your net asset value. But at some point in a cycle, you have to sort of look at the, the overall cycle and where you are. Um, and how does that affect your investment decisions? Or do you focus on net asset value versus sort of where you are in the cycle and what you can create? With, uh, with more capital. And um, <laughs> Tony? You know, I think, uh, <coughs> I think a big factor now is something that Andreas uh, uh, pointed out earlier is that, um, you know, when you're generating significant amount of cash flow, it, it really kind of accumulates uh, in terms of NAV very quickly. So I think looking at, uh, I think I've never been a fan of forward looking NAV calculations, but I think now it makes a lot of sense given the uh, uh, the cash accumulation that we're all enjoying right now. So. And when you look at the order book, now, did you have a comment, Jacob? No, I think there will be rewards to shareholders from all of these companies on, on, on stage here uh, in the coming quarters, there's no doubt, in terms of uh, distribution, dividends, and share buybacks. That would be very surprising to me if that's not the prime allocation of capital. 
Yeah, and I was going to come to that. What do you see now as sort of the most optimal way of employing capital? Is that to just return it, or is it to uh, yeah, shoot, shoot? Add to, this NAV, add to the NAV bit. I mean, right now, we, we see important to call a spade a spade. The analysts are well behind the NAVs. They are seriously well behind. They have no clue about how strong the spot market is right now, or has been for the last three weeks. And they have no clue about what the S&P market has been. That's not their fault. We have information because we see our bookings. We have information on the S&P because we see the negotiations from the sale and purchase brokers. They are not published. The analysts are obligated to use the balance sheets of March 31. If you just use the cash generated between March 31 and today, right now, June the 22nd, you would have a remarkably different number in the NAVs for all of us. And yes, Tony is damn right that you should be looking at forward NAVs here and forward cash flow because not only are the rates very strong, not only are the voyages much longer, but the charterers are having to reach out further to get their secured cargo. So in other words, we already have more percentage booked forward than we would usually have in a market. I would just make that comment. And it's very normal. We've seen this in every cycle. As a market accelerates upwards, analysts are well behind on NEVs. As a market crashes, you get the other absurdity. Oh, remember those things about OSG? Oh, OSG's NAV is 40. Really? Well, it was probably 20 as it was falling to towards chapter 11 in a falling market. So it happens both ways, up and down. They will lag. And now with the current market, normally you would see, as good as it is, normally you would see a flood of orders coming in. But we see a huge inflation in every sort of input factor and, and rising yard costs. Does that put a damper on uh, new buildings coming in? And could that be uh, something that helps prolong the cycle? Michael or Jakob? Yeah. No, I think it's, it's one of the most important points, right, that um, the new build prices have gone to a level and deliveries are so far out that we're actually seeing a, a very absurd situation, which is that you're having strong earnings, massive cash generation, and yet when you look at the forward price of new build versus the second-hand prices today, they are still way above, right? And what you would normally see in a market like this is you'd see second-hand prices exceed the replacement value for new builds. So... You're not seeing that. We don't think you know, you're going to see that in the foreseeable future. But more importantly, even if we wanted to ruin the market, even if all of us here wanted to say, you know, let's go out and order 150 new product tankers, great, you know, that's what we always do. You can't do it because basically you're in 2025 and onwards. So that may be one of the most important parts of the market having legs is that that kind of, uh, that kind of action has been taken away from ship owners. It's just not possible. I think we should send thanks to the container industry for making so many orders that actually, even if we wanted to, as Michael says, there's really not, nothing we can touch until somewhere 2025, 2026. So, yeah, a, a big thanks to, the, to that industry. <laughs> we, 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 also, we also have shareholders who don't want us to make orders. I mean, look at the pressure Michael's under. He's number one shareholder sitting, you know, three <laughs> yards away, <laughs> right? You dare order another ship, right? <laughs> what about you, Harold, in the sort of sophisticated chemical tank business? No, I, I can only uh, confirm what's already been said. Uh, uh, the, 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 the new building prices today are, are not sustainable. S uh, I returned from Japan a couple of weeks ago, and uh, when I talked to the shipyard owners, they didn't even bother to, to pitch in new orders because they, they, they saw themselves that, uh, that no one is ordering in, in, uh, at the present uh, price level. And the question of fuel, new fuel types, fuel types, etc. Does that put a damper on, on the orders as well? Well, it doesn't put a damper on the orders, but it adds to the cost. So typically, uh, if you order dual fuel in Japan, and you ha will have to add uh, six to eight millions, and um, I think it's difficult to to make that calculation on top of the already high prices. The um and just switching in a bit at the end here on decarbonization. Um, Tony, your company invested in hydrogen, a company called E1 Marine recently. Uh, what was the rationale behind that? And how do you integrate that into your business? 
So in a nutshell, it was part of our overall energy transition plan, uh, which is technology, sustainable cargoes, and projects. Um, the, it was a relatively minor investment, uh, five million of cash and five million issuance of shares. Uh, that was the investment into Element One. Uh, we also set up the JV, and we also uh, got a very attractively priced uh, PREF deal from Maritime Partners for 40 million. So it all it all worked out very well. It's what the system really does is it essentially takes methanol and water to produce hydrogen on demand to run fuel cells on board ship. Uh, the only alternative is to store hydrogen on board the vessel, and that's uh, quite problematic. Making good progress, we have uh, class approval, building our first uh, tugboat unit here um, in, in the U.S., and uh, working on some other uh, demo units. So. And uh, Jakob, are you involved in the safe type of investments? No, we're currently not. Uh, I think we see our role uh, pretty much as was described also earlier that, uh, that there's, I think there's two themes. Uh, one, really as an industry, we need to take the responsibility of working towards zero in 2050. That takes collaboration across the value chain, not only ship owners, shipyards, customers, of course, everything that is taking place also now in Singapore with the MPA and it's taking place also in Denmark with the most mckinney Muller. Institute. So I think that's, that's one thing. The other thing that we are doing is saying, listen, it's all the small pieces that you can actually do today. The actions you take today really matter. So we've accelerated our ambition around lowering our CO2 footprint for the fleet. So instead of meeting the IMO regulatory need of 40% lowering on a relative basis by 2030, we've set, we've set the ambition to reach that 40% goal already by 2025. And Again, it's not a magical one step. That is actually that you do a lot of hard work on multiple areas, whether it's digitization, better use of data, or whether it's your, the paint that you use on board the ships. It's a multiple of things that you do. I think it's our responsibility to take those actions now and lower the CO2 emission in parallel with obviously having the ultimate goal of decarbonization. So this is not black and white. Miguel, we saw the list of the BW companies here earlier, actively involved. I assume this is something you take very serious on your side as well. Yeah, so I think, uh, well, I think with Hafner, we are more or less on, on, on the same page as Tom, right? That we are, it's about collaboration, it's about uh, being aware. Uh, we're trying to run a business and, you know, it's not an investment strategy to put money out on, on different projects. But that being said, you know, I think it's really, as Jacob mentioned, it's about trying to focus on what you can do today with your existing fleet. So, uh, and then, yeah, as you said, the group is already heavily involved in, in many things, so we'll all learn from that, hopefully, going forward. Excellent. And how, uh, on your customer's side, how focused are they? Are they sort of in your soup on a daily basis, saying you have to implement or we won't charter with you? Or, Harold, how is that on, the, on your side? Yeah, our experience is that, like us, our customers are focused on the scope one uh, emissions. So, uh, so the the focus on uh, on their scope three emissions have has so far been uh, been uh, very limited. What we see now is that this is changing, and uh, there is an increasing focus on uh, on among our customers also on uh, on on our scope one emissions. So yes, uh, we see a trend that this becomes more and more important. Wonderful. I see uh, Matt and Mike sitting here saying time out to me. So, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Congratulations and uh, see you around. Thanks.